the smart glasses face-off panel. And in a moment, I will introduce the faces. Uh, CEOs and uh, business leaders from uh, companies who have done tremendous things with smart glasses. About myself, my background's in smartphones, and before that in PDAs. 25 years ago, I was involved in creating some of the first successful PDAs, and shortly afterwards, some of the first successful smartphones. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I should say, I was also involved in the creation of many unsuccessful smartphones. But hey, all of that's learning. And indeed, it's very much my view that there's a lot that previous industries have done which can teach this emerging smart glasses industry how to transition from being in the state of geekery, technological excitement, into being a mainstream industry. My job here today is to act as a kind of a umpire or referee to prevent any punches under the belt. Occasionally to hold up a yellow card or to send one of the faces into the sin bin if they're being a little bit too provocative about the potential of their company's products compared to the others. I'm also here to lay out the borders of the pitch in which we're playing. And we're starting here on the first border today, 2014, which we can characterize as we've already been in this industry for some cases 15 years, some cases five years, there's been five years of AWE. And I think we can summarize this present state of the industry as the smart glasses are poised for breakthrough. And we are looking ahead to perhaps in five years time a great transition. The same kind of transition which has happened in the last five years to tablets. If we wind back five years ago, 2009, there were a few tablets around. Some people were excited about them, but they weren't actually that widespread and that accepted. And then less than five years ago, the iPad came along, and then the iPad 2, and now nobody bats an eyelid if we see an 18-month-year-old child, an 18-month-old child uh, doodling on an iPad. We just think that's standard, whereas five years ago, we would have been shocked at such a possibility. So what is the possibility for smart glasses to make the same transition into being accepted, widely appreciated, and highly valued. I believe it's probably about 70% likely we will have got to that transition by then. But the big question we're here today to ask is, which will be the companies that will succeed in that transition? Because we're in a time of a disruptive innovation. We're in a time of volcanoes exploding, to refer back to the analogy of Professor Ishii from this morning. There will be a lot of creative destruction along the way. And creative destruction doesn't just apply to the incumbents who, are fa who aren't able to move fast enough. Creative destruction, alas, often applies to the early pioneers who are a bit too early and who end up getting arrows in their back because it's just too hard to get these early products to work. So what i am asked each of the panelists, CEOs and business leaders, to talk about in an opening three to four minute slot is why their companies are special. Why will their companies, their services and products succeed and indeed soar over the few years ahead as opposed to many others which will sadly, I think this is a fair prediction, sadly many great and good companies will uh, sink, uh, largely being forgotten by five years time even though they were doing great things. So each of them, as I said, will have about three to five minutes. Then we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll open it up to comments from the audience. And I'll be keeping an eye on the hash AWE 2014 Twitter stream. I may feed some comments from that into the panel discussion, and at the end, we'll certainly have uh, microphones going around the audience. So get your arrows ready in case you want to shoot them into the backs of any of these uh, pioneers, or in case you want to illuminate the way forwards. We're coming in this order, and first I'd like to hand over to Paul Travers, the CEO of Vizix. Paul. Uh, what a nice introduction, especially the arrows in the back component, because Vizix is one of those companies that has gotten many years of arrows in the backs. We've been at this since 1997, and actually myself, a previous company that did go down with the ship, was a company called Forte Technologies, and we came out with the first sort of Oculus Rift-esque device way back then. And I can tell you that over all these years, this is a really difficult problem to solve, and there's been all kinds of crazy shots at this. Much of this stuff that you're seeing right here were all sort of proverbial hammers looking for the nail. Good ideas, and the basis for actually where we are today, in my opinion, there's finally starting to be a lot of really cool looking devices out there that are coming, but they're still, for the most part, quite odd and early entrant kind of devices. That said, <clears throat> some of them have a lot of utility. 
And what Vuzix has learned over the years is the best thing you can do is find a place that can be revenue generating as fast as possible. And so the first offering that we had that is truly a pair of smart glasses is our M100. And these guys were designed and focused on the enterprise space. That is an industry, if you look at all the hype, you know, they're talking about upwards of two or three billion dollars worth of smart glasses being sold this year. I, I don't know if I can go that far, but I can tell you that in the enterprise space, without doubt, there's real return on investments and opportunities for companies to have a value proposition around smart glasses. And in those cases, it's not so much what the devices look like, it's what do you get, how much do they cost, and how quickly do they pay for themselves. For Vuzix, we have thousands of systems in the field already. The bulk of them are into enterprise kind of applications for the M100, real time, hands free. And in fact, I'm gonna give you an example here really quickly of an application in a bakery in Belgium. And in this case, this gentleman's wearing the M100 and he's just clancing up really quickly at, these, at the QR codes on the wall and it's simply telling him, drop five of these, drop two of those. The guy runs around, fills up the buckets, they ship to the customer and he does the next run. Significantly faster significantly um, less error rates. It's just a big return on investment. The guys are hands-free, so they can actually do their job. Really simple, works really well, and the employees don't want to use anything else. This is where they want to be. They don't want to go back to paper picking. Okay, so it's great. Vuzix is going to be here, I believe, number one, because we have a strategy that is focusing on the low-hanging fruit and where the real business opportunities are, and we have a focus on trying to get over this problem. We are at the real early stage of these devices. In an industry, you can get away with a lot. But in the consumer space, to the contrary, these are fashion statements. And for a lot of people, there's two things. It's got to look good, my latest watch. And number two, it's got to bring a lot of value. This is, in my opinion, where we're at today. We get the number one question can you guys hire an industrial design firm to fix the way these things look? And it's just not that easy. The conventional optics don't get you there. So for us, we think we're really in the first days of this business. It's the early cell phone days. We need to get from this slide over here in the corner. No, I'm not sure there's a laser pointer on here, top one. So this is where we've been for many long years. I believe we're finally moving over here for tools. This is happening. I can see it at Vuzix every time we turn around, more and more customers, programs being rolled out. But this is where everybody would like to be. And to get there, I believe a significant change in the technology needs to happen. And that's what Vuzix has been focusing on. We have a program that we'll be delivering to the Navy Research Labs by the fall of this year. The optics engines are this small in them. These are just models, but we do have functioning versions of these waveguides working. Display engines, optics, literally they'll fit in a pair of Oakley glasses ultimately making the technology disappear, then the pieces that are missing are the use cases. And there are many, many companies, if you just even walk around out here, that are developing use cases that will be very, very compelling for these kinds of devices. So for Vuzix, we have a stable place to be today, a growing business, and we have a future that looks really bright with the technology that we've been developing. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and no yellow card for you, keeping on time, thank you so much. We're now gonna to move to Steve Willey, who is the CEO of Innovega, and his product's a bit different, as you'll hear. Uh, thanks, David, um, appreciate it. I guess I'd echo uh, comments by uh, David that it's gonna take staying power to win in this industry, and, uh, and Paul's comments that the, what we're doing here is very hard, and all, all the creators in the, uh, in the AR space knows that. We've uh, attacked the problem of eyewear in a, in a different way, different from my colleagues on the stage, by breaking the problem into two pieces. Uh, one piece is uh, how do we deliver the content, the media, the, the stuff that we augment our world with? And our answer to that is a pair of glasses. Familiar, convenient, keep convenient, lightweight, cool, stylish. It's got to simply be a pair of glasses. The second part of the problem is if it's a pair of glasses and you put your glasses on your face and the media is hanging half inch from your eye, how on earth do you focus on that media? You know, we're not equipped as humans to focus half inch from the eye. So we break the problem into two pieces. Our system, therefore, is a pair of glasses and a, and a set of optics. And the optics, we drop into a contact lens. If you can take the all, all the necessary optics and bring the optics as close to the normal lens of the eye, the optics can be extremely tiny, submillimeter. 
So you can take a modern contact lens and by modifying it slightly, by adding this uh, tiny optic, you can, you can it, the, the lens would perf perform its normal function of correcting your vision, but it would also enable you to see incredibly well half inch from your eye. So our system is a, is a frame, a pair of Oakleys, a pair of Ray-Bans. You add to that frame a small flat panel, large flat panel, little projection components, the emissive source, the media, the content, a pair of Ray-Bans, the person wearing our system, full functioning system. And to that pair of glasses, that pair of smart glasses, if you will, you have the second component, and that's the contact lens that you wear. And I'm often asked, well, who's going to wear a contact lens to consume media, to access media, to augment their world? And I usually answer, well, there's 140 million wear contact lenses today. And 100 million happen to be 18 to 34 years of age. You know, they own the online gaming market, the download market, the smartphone market. So that's probably our available market. And 20% of 18 to 34-year-olds are all wearing, already wearing contact lenses. So they're going to go to Walmart like 50% of them do and they're gonna order the media version of a contact lens, their normal prescription, and the media version is gonna allow them to, to consume media a half inch from the eye, which is where it's gonna be as they throw on their glasses. And that's an actual photograph of a person wearing a contact lens. So ours is an optic system. It's a radical optic system trying to get at this hard problem that, uh, that Paul described. And at the end of the day, it's gonna create incredibly rich media, no compromise rich media, but it's gonna be a pair of familiar comfortable glasses with no compromise on the weight and bulk of the glasses. When I say rich media, full 3D, full HD, the native field of view of the optics and the contact lens is 180 degrees by 120 degrees, which means anything you put in front of that contact lens wrapped into your glasses will be fully available to you. So you think about AR, it's not a matter of holding a phone and having a five or 10 degree field of view and moving around, it's now your complete visual system is your digital canvas, your AR canvas. In terms of resolution, our first product was a megapixel, a mega, one and a half megapixel, but we'll move to two and four and eight megapixel. So there'll be no shortage of resolution and our optics are not resolution uh, limited. So a single optic that you're wearing on your eye pro is providing you with, with monocular systems, biocular systems, transparent AR systems, immersive VR systems, all your changing of the glasses. And on the other side of the coin, it is a pair of glasses. It's about the right weight, the, the form factor we're familiar with. You're not wearing, a, if, if, you wear, if you have a prescription, like 50% of humans on the planet have a prescription, 75% of Chinese, 85, 90% of Singaporeans have a prescription. You're not having to wear a separate pair of glasses or separate lenses in your eyewear because it's incorporated into your contact lens. And we can also add other cool things to contact lenses. They would naturally have polarization, like a pair of sunglasses. We could change the color of your eye. And of course, we can add sensors. So the lens has become important. Here's a one minute video. This is actual footage through our lens. We're in San Diego, so this is just looking over our bay, uh, the bay in San Diego and you know, dropping uh, imagery. I apologize for the quality. We shot it about a year ago and we didn't put a lot of attention into media quality. So our engineer in his, his back garden, dashboard comes up, selects the weather, full field of view, full bright environment, jumps in his car, navigation, uh, Bluetooth to the vehicle, halfway in the sky, all wearing contact lens and a pair of glasses as you need them. Vegas, so the next uh, and, and uh, prescient question here is, uh, will we survive? Will we sink or swim? We think about risk, technology risk, product risk, uh, regulatory risk. From a technology standpoint, we've got 10 solid patents. Most all have been granted. Absolute green space. No one thought of using a lens and a pair of glasses. Uh, the products have got phenomenal capabilities, field of view, resolution, et cetera. There's a regulatory issue, contact lens, the FDA approves them. They've been approving them for 50 years. We're not using anything toxic, anything weird, so it's a six-month approval. We're going after a couple of vertical markets. Defense is an obvious, low-vision patients, five million low-vision patients in the U.S. And then, of course, this consumer market, 100 million 18 to 34-year-olds that are wearing lenses today. That's kind of the low-hanging fruit. In capital risk, we've uh, managed to uh, operate the company on, on profits, and we're not starving for cash. Um, we'll take advantage of it as we, as we see it, but we, we certainly will not fail through lack of cash. Thank you. Many thanks, Steve.
So no doubt you've got uh, more and more questions in your mind as you've been hearing these pitches, but please let's hold on to these questions until the whole panel have had a chance to introduce. The next speaker is from the company who's probably got the best known name in the wide uh, general public's view th than all the others. Uh, so Eric, what is Epson doing with uh, smart glasses? Over to you. David, thanks for having me. And I uh, wanted just to quickly introduce um, myself. I'm the product manager of New Ventures for Epson America, overseeing the Moverio smart glasses. And this is actually our third year at AWE, and it's really, really exciting to see just kind of the, the growth and interest in the space, as well as um, you know, all of the, the interest in wearables and smart glasses. So I just wanted to quickly introduce Epson uh, by a press release that came out recently where we joined an Immersive Technology Alliance. And this was from Ben Gilbert over at uh, Engadget. And he announced Epson as you know, partnering with Oculus, Avagant, and several others. And the funniest thing I thought that followed on this, this Twitter feed was uh, a couple of the comments that came up. You know, they're working on an Oculus printer that shoots ink into your eyes. <laughs> or you get black and white for free, but each additional color costs $80 and needs to be replaced <laughs> monthly. You know, so it's definitely the perception of Epson is that association with our inkjet printer business. And, you know, that is, you know, one of the cool things about our company is that we, we do have, you know, we are a large company that, that's focused on imaging technologies. But what a lot of people don't know is that we're also leaders in the projection market. So we sell the most number of projectors in the world as well as in the US and we actually own all of our core technology. And why will Epson succeed in this space? It's really because we have tech, uh, patents going back over 15 years on smart glasses technology. We are completely vertically integrated, meaning that we own all of our own manufacturing. So we control our own destiny. And we have a massive R&D team you know, from our projector uh, and printer businesses that are constantly looking into new technologies. I think one thing about Epson that a lot of people don't know is our core strength is really in R&D. So if you look at number of patents issued by, in the US by companies, you know, Epson is always going to be around the top 10. In fact, um, a lot of people are surprised to know that we get more patents every year than, say, Apple and Google. Uh, but a lot of our cooler technologies actually uh, get OEM'd and they, they go into other people's uh, products. But our new president and CEO, um, Mr. Asui, he is really looking to grow new, new businesses, uh, new branded businesses for Epson. And the Moverio smart glasses are you know, kind of the first uh, first venture into that new space. So one of the, one of the real things that differentiates, I, I feel, um, our platform is A, the price. Uh, we're at $699. Uh, B, uh, we're, tr we're transparent, not only transparent, but binocular in the center of your field of view. So for you know, an event like this, where we're focused on augmented reality, it really does um, you know, permit uh, true kind of overlay digital overlay. And I think the, th the third thing that's really great, and we can finally say this, is that we're, we're shipping. So we're widely available. And um, we uh, started shipping in April. And you can even log in today on the uh, Epson store and be able to purchase glasses. So I think um, the, th the three things that really differentiate Epson and are really going to contribute to our success is A, our um, R&D capabilities, B, you know, we have you know, all of our other businesses supporting our, uh, this new initiative for us. And uh, three is you know, our production capabilities. You, know, you can always um, know that if you put in an order for you know, five, 10,000 pairs of glasses, you know, we're going to deliver on time. And you know, you're going to get consistent quality that you can expect from uh, Epson. Just continuing to run through the panelists, the next uh, company is OptInvent, and we have Kevin Mirza, who is the CEO. So tell us more about your company and your product, and why you deserve to be in the cover of a time in uh, 2019. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, I guess uh, nobody has a crystal ball, but hey, 
If Oculus got bought for two billion by Facebook, we should all get bought by it for, for 50, right? <laughs> Hell, what's this world coming to? And uh, you know, uh, I think that, I think how do you top some of these presentations? That's pretty difficult to do, but I think a lot of really important and, and pertinent things have been said. Uh, this is a very difficult space to be in. Uh, there's a lot of extremely dif difficult hardware challenges to be, to be resolved. Uh, it's optics, it's physics, you know, it, hardware does not fall out of the sky. Uh, people do work on it. Uh, Moore's law, unfortunately, doesn't apply to a lot of this stuff. So many challenges going ahead, but I think that we, here we have a lot of companies that are going to solve some of these challenges. Um, I, I think a lot of these companies actually will be around for the next five years. They will not all disappear uh, because I think each of us is, is addressing the market in a different way and it's a huge potential market. I don't think it's a niche where you know, it's gonna consolidate within the next five years. I think there's enough space for all of us to play. Um, having said that, so we'll, we'll present a little bit about our company and our technology, our product called the Aura which we think is a, a new paradigm in, in this space. Um, show you a little entertaining video to wake you up before I put you back to sleep with my slides. A little bit about our vision of where this is going. 321 meters to the hole. An easterly wind is blowing at one mile per hour. Congratulations, you got a hole in one. Of course, he's wearing our eyewear. What did you expect? Publish so, photo to Instagram. There's sports applications, social media applications, point of view, camera. All these things are feasible. Just haven't developed all these apps yet. That's why we're looking for app developers like some of you. Hole in one, eh? What would you expect? I hold my calls for the rest of this meeting. Will do. And as you guys can see, next up is the Titan. Okay, so I think that's probably all we have time for. And of course, our, our hero gets the girl because he's wearing our eyewear. So guys, got to go out there and order them. Um, I'm unfortunately old enough to have used one of those um, in the 80s. How many of you have used something like that? Raise your hands. Okay, great. I see that some of you are lying. Come on, guys. There's some other senior citizens like me in the room. So I, I actually, this was a revolution when this came out, man. I was like, back in university, these things were in a back room, and then all of a sudden, they're on your desk. And then in the 90s, there was another revolution where these things actually became more mobile and gave us more freedom. And I didn't use one of those. I actually used something a little bit better. But I, on purpose, put some of these earlier versions of products on this chart to say that, well, the way we see mobile computing going is towards something that's as close to our mobile computer as possible. I mean, this is for us a logical evolution, and we're actually in the early stages. I mean, you know, the glasses are that right now. Uh, they haven't evolved much past that. We're, we're really in the early stages, and it's a very exciting time to be here. Um, but for us, there is absolutely no doubt that that's where this is going. It's going to liberate us from looking down at you know, I mean, how liberating is this experience being hunched over a cell phone and, you know, like, you know, on a, on a foreign screen? Um, I, I think as human beings, that just does not make sense. Uh, what makes, I think, a little bit more sense is something that's going to be closer to our CPU, giving us that real-time information right in our eyes. So I'm fully convinced that that's where it's going. Um, how we're going to get there is obviously we're building a developer platform. Uh, so shameless plug for uh, our uh, developer platform called the Aura One, which is currently on, on pre-order, and we would like to build the ecosystem with this. That's the first step. You know, these things are platforms, and they're just as good as the apps that run on them. I think most of these gentlemen will, will share that sentiment that, uh, yeah, it's an empty platform, just like the iPhone was back in 2007. I don't think, you know, Steve Jobs imagined Angry Birds as the killer app on the iPhone. Um, so I don't think we've imagined the killer apps for these yet. And these things do have an extreme high, extremely high barrier to entry, and the high barrier to entry is the retinal projector. A lot of these work 
on a retinal projection system which actually brings uh, the light into your eye. And a lot of people think the screen is in front of your eye. Well, that's not the case. The screen is actually your retina. I mean, that's kind of scary, but no, we're just, we're just injecting light into your eyes. We're not ink printing or anything, um, <laughs> as Eric said. <laughs> so these are, these are retinal projectors based on physics and optics and very exotic components. But what we've done at OptInvent, and that's where we differentiate ourselves, is we've taken that kind of exotic function and simplified it with a very easy to produce optical system that's ba based on a molded plastic light guide. We have the only one in the world like this. It, there's no holograms, no diffractive elements, no polarizers, it's one piece of plastic that comes out of a mold. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we can do that cheaply. And I always say there's three rules to consumer products. Cost is number one, number two is cost, and number three is cost. No, actually that's not true, but yeah, cost is very, very important, and we, we have one of the systems that I think could scale uh, for a consumer product to reduce the cost in a dramatic way. Uh, we have what we call the flip view feature. I invite you to over, over to our booth to experience this for yourself. We think this is important. Um, it's, it is about AR and having things in your field of view, uh, but it's actually Google's also right. It is about glancing at information once in a while. Um, we, we, we do both. Uh, we think that both of those are actually necessary and pertinent. Um, comparison versus glass, I guess I could hit below the belt because Google's not on the panel. So we have a display that's actually three times the surface area of Google. Obviously field of view is important and then we have these two positions. So I don't know of anybody who looks at their smartphone like this. You know, uh, uh, Google Glass is, it's a companion device. I, I see it as a smartwatch that you wear on your face and you gotta look up here to see in the, in the information. Well, you can't really do AR with that, and we think AR is a very compelling part of this stuff. Uh, our technology roadmap, um, you know, obviously this is a first-gen product. It's big, it's bulky, but, you know, remember the, the phones. Uh, I think Paul showed a slide of the guy with the big Motorola brick. Well, that's the Motorola brick, um, but it'll get to a smaller form factor very soon. These things, this is moving very quickly. So we're working on some new optics and miniaturization. This is the name of the game. And again, I think we have the know-how. The team has 20 years of experience. We're not just you know, new grads, uh, no offense. Uh, we're not just new grads from some university uh, that did a Kickstarter. I mean, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've been working on eyewear for seven years. Um, you know, back then, people were like, what planet are you guys from? But you know, now we're visionaries all of a sudden. So anyways, um, that's what we do, and we thank you for listening to this. Thank you. That was great. I go over. That was good. The last uh, member, but by no means the least, is uh, from Athia Labs, uh, Suleiman Itani. Suleiman, uh, let's hear about your mobile 3D platform. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I actually stuck to three minutes, so this will be much shorter than most other presentations. The big, big, big difference between what everyone else is doing here and is this better? Not much. I'll hold it. Uh, the big, big, big difference is that uh, we're actually a, a software platform. And while everyone else here on the panel is perfecting and solving all of the hard problems on the optics and the displays, we're looking at the experience and at the input uh, in or, and ergonomics. So this is very, so when Epson flies, okay, that's great for us. We'll just port our software there. When, uh, okay. So I'll just, uh, yeah, when Vuzix or OptInvent or Innovega or everything, we're just leveraging that because as they all said, optics is freaking uh, difficult. But the problem is that, and, and this is another gap that has plagued the, the head-mounted display industry for like at least the last 20 years, is that there is no right input. It's very difficult uh, and and we have we have met with around 35 
um, of the of the Fortune 100 companies uh, who are interested in these things. And one of the big reasons that they haven't already used all of these glass devices is that there isn't the right input paradigm. Um, and so what we're coming from is that we give you a tablet floating in front of you in the air and you can actually touch it and use it. Of course, you can use voice, you can use head motion, and with time you'll be able to use many more things. Um, but that takes the experience to a full other level. The other thing that we did, uh, Kaifan mentioned that, hey, this is a platform play and you have to start your platform from somewhere and you need all of these applications. So we, uh, we integrated with Android and you can run a million apps right off the bat. Uh, some of them are, are not very useful in this paradigm, but some of them are pretty, pretty useful. You know, even simple things like lying down and having your Kindle floating in front of you and just swiping it instead of having to carry the tablet. So the difference is, is that we're focusing on input, we're solving that problem, we're a software platform, so no matter who we win, who wins, we would win. And um, yeah, and we're looking at the experience and ergonomics. Of course, we have our SDK with AR and 3D and all of that to, to take Android to this other level, which it's, it's not built for right now. Uh, but we also want to use the existing e ecosystem, Nokia, which is a great company, failed at pushing its ecosystem, right? So, so building something like Android or iOS is, is unbelievably difficult. Uh, and so instead of building one, we want to leverage whatever is out there. So the experiences and everything in this video, this video is, uh, is, has not been shot through our glasses, but all of the experiences uh, have been done on our glasses. So have, they have been at least prototyped on our system. So that, it's, this is a part of the long video. So um, that's one thing that's about technology and our approach and our positioning in the value chain. So we're input, we're ergonomics, we're software, uh, and we're leveraging existing ecosystems. But also in terms of the access to market, we're actually the closest, we're closest to Vuzix here. Of course, we're the software layer, they're doing all the hard stuff on the optics. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that we're first approaching uh, industrial applications and and we have these multi-billion dollars fortune 50 companies that we're working with on taking these experiences right to the nurse the nurse needs you know they they now 50 percent of doctors have ipads or you know a tablet and those tablets have maybe the most germs compared to anything else in the world right because they're touching all of that and then touching the screen um but but with with something like that where the tablet is floating in the air and you touch it you know suddenly all of those problems disappear there are all of these challenges for medical uh, professionals um, and of course uh, privacy and security and all of this it is much 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 enhanced another example of course is being in the field for fields engineers from construction to oil to mining and you know, getting the information, sharing it, being able to manipulate it, looking up stuff in addition to augmented reality. And, and we've been able to identify people who have, like it's a huge ROI for them. They're ready to pay 20 something thousand dollars for these glasses because it's a, it makes you know, a 1% uh, difference in their, um, in their bottom line. And that's, that's a huge amount of money. Of course, later, it will trickle down into some vertical consumerish applications, like you go to a car shop and you change the color of the car, uh, right, or gaming and stuff like that. And then finally, it will go to a uh, full device. 
but basically, just to recap, yeah, we're we're aligned with all of these. There's no face-off here between, from our side. Thank you so much. So, let's have some discussion amongst the team. Let's say uh, pose the question about uh, winning prizes. We referred briefly to possibly being on the front cover of uh, Time, uh, although probably by that stage it won't be printed. It'll just be appearing in your glasses. Uh, we don't quite have that yet, but last night, some of you were probably in this room for the Oggies, yes? And I saw one of these uh, companies being awarded the prize for the best uh, hardware uh, for the time being, which was, in this case, Epsom. So the other panelists, what makes it uh, about your product that gives you the chance that next year you will be winning that prize and even bigger prizes? So just, a, uh, just a 60 seconds at the most, if you like. What, what, what makes you stand so, and I'm, yeah? Quickly? Because we're going to be a sponsor too, like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to say, if you look at the Twitter feed, you've already got some bad, bad feedback on Twitter. So let's try and read. So I think uh, there's more to it than that, surely. Yes? Any other comment, Paul? Yeah, certainly this is the beginning of the game. And, and it is great that Seiko Epson is shipping a product. Right. And that does make a big difference, yes. quite frankly. Um, although Vuzix is shipping products, we don't have a focus necessarily in the same space that the Seiko Epson guys do today. And it does help having such a large name. But by then, Vuzix will have caught up to that name, so. Right. Steve? Um, yeah. We think field of view is really important to AR. And we don't suffer a, a sort of the compromise that one normally needs to make between the, 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 either the Oculus bulk versus the, uh, the, the Google Glass Svelte design. And on that basis, if we can deliver to the community a massive field of view, consistent and transparent, massive with resolution, consistent with AR needs, then uh, we hope to earn a, a part of this community. So suddenly people will realize there's a different kind of model that's possible instead of being restricted to something quite narrow, it's much wider. Correct. Suleiman? Um, yeah, actually we, uh uh, we have uh, all of these partners, uh, some, the partners that we're working with on creating optics, and I, I actually think in terms of, uh, of the hardware, by next year, by the end of next year, the size of Google Glass and the large field of view would, would probably be, be close. It will not be far away. And so Epson will, will have some, I mean, they'll do a great job, but they'll have more competition uh, by next year. Kevin? We're going to be a sponsor, too. Going to be a sponsor. <laughs> and Eric, do you still think you'll be blazing the trail ahead of the competition? Because, of course, we've only got uh, five panelists here, and there's at least uh, 10 companies that are producing products in this space. Do you see that you'll still be blazing the trail? Yes. Um, you know, Epson has really kind of scaled up uh, investments in, in the business, and we've got uh, some cool stuff in the labs. Let's talk about timescales, because we saw the picture of Marty Cooper, the Motorola engineer, holding that uh, huge, enormous device. He initially made the phone call, first of all, in New York in 1972, and it took Motorola 10 years to make that a commercial product. And according to some inside rumors, it took Motorola another 10 years after that before they'd made back enough money on all that investments. That's 20 years from that now. I mean, how soon is it? I mean, I talked at the beginning about the potential for smart glasses being widely accepted in the public by five years. Is that credible or not? What, what, let's put your predictions uh, out as to how fast is this industry really possibly going to change, or is it, will it be as slow as these other industries before they actually happened? I think the uptake in the enterprise space is going yeah. to be fast. It's already proving itself in many areas to be a, a big success. There are very large companies like SAP that are employing it throughout their systems. And so customers in the enterprise space see this value, get the return on investment, so there's lots of incentive there. In the consumer space, I am convinced that if they don't look like a pair of Oakleys, sexy, cool, <laughs> it's going to be a limited marketplace. No offense to Seiko Epson, their device is not bad looking, but it is still not something you'd walk down the street wearing in New York City. Anybody else got views on timescales? I I definitely agree with Paul that you need killer applications to really drive adoption. Um, and that's, you know, we don't really envision kind of an always on use case in the near term just because it is, it's the social acceptance factor is still uh, very low. Um, and we've seen that kind of play out kind of in the press with, um, you know, some, some things that have happened with glass, you know, out in public. But um, I think if you can identify those killer apps 
and um, build to those, I think you know that social acceptance will gradually come up. You know, once people get more comfortable with them. Let's imagine another possible future briefly. Let's imagine that this hasn't gone to plan. Let's imagine that we're back gathering in some dingy hovel in 2019 saying, gosh, you know, we really were naive, we misunderstood, we missed our chance. What potentially could go wrong to make all our grand plans uh, fail? What, what do you worry about? Yeah, I, I think uh, Google and uh, Oculus specifically, we can call them smart glasses, they are highly motivated now to hit the ground running and prove this market space, marketplace. And what could go wrong is that they would uh, trip and get blooded and, and hurt the entire industry and community. So I'm looking for them to be uh, successful and they have the vigor and the cash to uh, prove themselves in the near term. So I just, I just hope they do. And I believe um, you know, we can be successful to some extent because they're successful. So you're going to spend your spare time helping Google out? If we can. Uh, oh, yeah, we want them to succeed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. They, they no, always, we do. No question. They always tell us that when we meet them, but we say right back at you because you're the litmus test for this industry. Uh, if they fail, we kind of all fail. I mean, yeah, yeah prob they probably don't have the best product, but it does what it does well. It's a minimum viable product. I think it's got a lot of potential, and I want these guys to succeed. I want all these guys to succeed. And I'll make a prediction by way before 2019, if, if, I was, if Google was smart, which I'm sure they are, if Microsoft, Samsung, and uh, Twitter, and whoever, I'd buy up every single one of these guys. <laughs> that is, I mean, for me, that is uh, absolutely the future. If, if, uh, if they don't move, because a lot of us have the core technology capabilities, like I said, it does not fall out of the sky. Um, Samsung, I mean, these guys need to get into this game. So apart from complications over the core technologies, which we've heard is hard, any other things that you might imagine as reminiscing painfully in 2019 saying, and we should have seen this coming and we didn't? Well, it's all about the user experience, right? If you look back at the history of the tablet, the PDA and stuff like that, uh, at some point there was the initial uh, kind of leaders and, and the reason they failed, it's always that the user experience wasn't good enough to, to get them enough traction. Right? The Newton is you, a case in point. Yeah. yeah, 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 the Newton, I mean, a lot of. And, and, it's, and that is the tipping point right now, uh, right? Uh, you have to find the, the correct user experience to break. Otherwise, the market will tell you, oh, go nap for five more years till the next rev of technology. Uh, but here's where Paul, and I agree with him very, very strongly, is that in the industrial cases, in the enterprise, the user experience is already good enough and that's proven by these huge companies investing a lot of money and willing to put themselves on the table. So the market risk is So we much, seem to be solving less. that problem. Kudos to Google though, because until yes, Google came yes. out with glass, most of these companies we're, were not even caring to look. Absolutely. Yes. Fair yes. Enough. You right. gotta give yeah. them that consumer dream actually. Mm -hmm even in the enterprise space so that they yes. kind of see the picture. And yeah, again, kudos to Google, but you know, there is already a, a, a base for business in this area and certainly we're, we're addressing it as well. We also have a consumer vision for, for us. We see this definitely going to consumer, but um, it's in the enterprise space where we're gonna do our bread and butter business, I think, you know, before this thing takes off. But cycles are reducing and I think it will take off much sooner than people think. You know, I'm sorry, Big, huge headphones are not sexy, yet people do wear them. It's, it's branding. A lot of people, I mean, Beats Audio are probably not the best headphones in the world. People wear them around their necks because it's, it's a brand. And I think that could be the case for glasses. They may not need to look super sexy Oakley-like uh, if there is a brand that can convey the right kind of status lifestyle image. So Beats Audio today, Optivent, Optinvent tomorrow. People will be wearing them around their necks as well I'm as around sure their <laughs> on their heads. Absolutely. Let's have some questions from the floor. Any arrows Gray. or we suggestions? We just need Dr. Gray. People would like to <laughs> query any of the things you've heard from the... Yeah, I heard Dr. Gray's looking for a job. Hello? Now that, oh. now that Apple bought, uh, beats. Okay, I have an arrow for y'all. I'm from Texas. As a developer of enterprise applications, I don't want to restrict my customer base by limiting to specific form factors, uh, you know, of the platforms. The, um, as more of them proliferate, it becomes extremely expensive for small companies to have to invest in 
one or two or more uh, versions of each of the vision platforms. So the request is, can you make the developer uh, additions less expensive or, you know, some, <laughs> some type of uh, assistance or something there? Because I envision some of the same issues we have with Droid development, a lot of different handsets, a lot of different form factors and tablets, and you still have to test to some extent on the preferred tablet. And then I will say one further thing is, when you go to demo your product with your enterprise customers, seeing and touching and interacting and seeing their enterprise data on your platforms is extremely important. So I have to have access to those things, right? And then one, one last comment. If you got the stuff in beta, get it out to us, man. We'll hack it and, uh, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll do what we can do to give you feedback. That's all I can say. So. so how important in your overall priorities is looking after developers, given all the other issues you've talked about, like fixing the usability and fixing the hardware and the optics? How high? Because many companies in the smartphone space, I have to say, failed because although they gave lip service to the idea of developers, in practice they didn't fix the issues for developers, and developers were faced with a hugely fragmented space. An app that would run fine on one Nokia phone would not run fine on a, a Nokia phone with a very similar number, and nobody could figure that out. Too much fragmentation. Are you addressing that in your programs? It's or? everything for Vuzix. Uh, come and talk with me afterwards. <laughs> Developer kits are not expensive from Vuzix, in point of fact, and we have certain programs, if it's a broad-based application that can develop, you can end up with a pair of glasses at no charge. Um, so we are very supportive of the developer community. So you're happy to dance on stage to Steve Ballmer, developer, developer, developer? Straight up. <laughs> Straight up. I think, oh, go ahead, Kaiba. Sorry, I think we, we participated in the hackathon yeah. with Epson. Yeah. Um, you know, Monday and Tuesday, developers are the key to make this thing work. I mean, we, uh, as I set up on stage, we have a platform, but a platform is empty if you don't fill it with applications. And, you know, Paul, absolutely right. I mean, our, our developer kits are not as expensive either. I think they're even cheaper than Vuzix. Um, and we do give them away sometimes, depending on you know who, who the what the application developer is doing with it. And so it, it is key to set up this ecosystem. I mean, I don't think anybody could argue with that. It's great that you're at the hackathons, and I saw you there, and I was inspired. But are you listening to developers? Because it's one thing to give them. Is are you really taking a, a, a part in deep discussions about what their needs are and prioritizing your responses? Yes, actually we. The, the priorities in our SDK development is, comes directly from the developers and the partners, uh, much more than internally. So we, it's all based on the feedback from the developers, what they need to be fixed, what they prioritize. Next question from the floor. Right here. Yes, sure. Hi, Freeland Wild, Open University of the UK. I know that all of you are tackling the resolution problem, and uh, there's an exciting mid to long term future coming ahead of us. Um, for example, with the waveguide technology that, that Vuzix is developing. I even like the monochrome one um, that you had already last year. So that's very exciting, but there is one problem um, that is really tricky, and that is interaction with the devices. So I would be interested in where you see the future of interaction with the glasses. Surely not um, only in, in touchpad interaction or uh, gesture recognition or uh, voiceover, uh, as we probably uh, all have experienced this situation wearing some glasses, somebody sneaking up to you and saying, whispering into your frame, saying, open Chrome, start <laughs> pornography. Um, what, what is the next big thing that, is, that you see coming? And You've got some interesting so, friends. <laughs> yeah. So, so for, uh, for Epson, I mean, one thing we've learned over the past few years is that it really depends on the use case. Um, you know, for a lot of those industrial applications, it's some, you know, some cases it's a little bit too loud to use voice. Uh, recognition. Other cases, you want to keep your head stable, so you don't want head tracking. You may want to do uh, gesture yep. or eye tracking. So it really depends on the use case. Mm. Um, but as for like the broad consumer use case, it's it's still kind of up in the air. I'd say. I have to agree with uh, with Eric, and I think it's very much use case dependent. There is no magic formula for these things right now. There is no pinch and zoom touch screen. That is another. Uh, that's a different paradigm. Um, you know gesture recognition up here, pinch and zoom, that's not really gonna work, I think, uh, in this paradigm. I think what will work is gaze tracking. Yeah, I'll say it and probably think I'm crazy, but brainwave recognition, you know, that, that is the holy grail if we can get there. Um, we think about it, it happens. You know, gaze tracking, I think, could be an interim step, but I think it could be a combination of voice, touch, gesture uh, in, in the interim. There, there's not 
a magic formula, and that's the next chapter, I think, to be written in, in this story. Um, Athir is working on that stuff. We're going to solve the hardware problems, but you know, the UI problem is definitely there. I can say for Vuzik so far, the successful um, installations and applications are the ones with the simplest of interfaces. The guy in the, in the bakery was simply just look and do, look and do. You didn't even need to have voice to interact with it. So it's going to need clever implementations, I think. But that's what's yeah. nice about enterprise. It's, it's okay. more focused, specific applications to start. So question over here. Is that on? Yep. I'm an app developer as well. And uh, my studio has about 50 million applications, uh, or 50 million downloads so far as a studio. And our experience is we've you know, we've used PhoneGap, we've used the native SDKs, we've used Unity. And the challenge that I hear today is similar to what I kind of mentioned last night at the last panel, which was that there's multiple SDKs that are being thrown at us. We've got SDKs at the chipset level, we've got SDKs at the Matayo level, we've got SDKs now at the, uh, you know, at the hardware level. Um, it's not practical for a software, you know, the other app developer was mentioning costs in terms of just signing up to your program. Well, 85 to 90 percent of our operating costs are salaries. So our real cost is our human cost and what we put, where we allocate our time and resources and what we develop on. When you look at the installed base of your number of units, it's not practical for us to, you know, put a developer in, and have them customize code for one platform, then another platform, then another platform for something that numbers in the tens of thousands of units. I'll point out that Oculus sold a cumulative of uh, 20,000 units at the end of 2013. So what I would suggest to you all is that you develop a system that we can rally behind, similar to what app developers did with Unity. So Unity is now, I mentioned all the other ones we started off with. Well, now we can just use Unity and it kind of addresses all the major operating systems and also addresses augmented reality. Uh, so that's my uh, point to you guys. OK, well, I think we probably all agree with that, that it's a hard job to uh, figure out. Uh, if, we're, if we're not careful, we give too much, too many SDKs. And we have to figure out a way to uh, streamline it so that the, the poor developer doesn't have to uh, interact with so many different kits. Well, uh, just for OptInvent, in OptInvent's case, we're using a stock Android. It's Android 4.2.2. You, you do not need our SDK to do anything. You just use, it's like programming for any standard Android device. We do provide an SDK, but it's a very it's very low level stuff. It just manages the Bluetooth Wi-Fi connectivity stuff. But if you're a developer who's familiar with Android, you need you don't need it. You can just develop it like uh, on on our platform like any other Android device. It's generic. We've done that on purpose because of exactly what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that's the case for a lot of us up here. Is we're we're working with Android as well, um, just because it's open and we want to make it as easy as possible. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up, uh, focusing on developers' needs in a deep way rather than just a superficial way. Uh, we started late, and so we've run a little bit over the time, but I know we all need a bit of a bio break, uh, stretch our legs before the next session. So I'm going to cur curtail the discussion now. You can speak to any of these representatives either on stage now or in their booths. We'll give a round of applause, please, to every of them for this face-off. Thank you so much.